Afghanistan is synonymous with a failed state, but that wasn't always so. As a matter of fact, in the 1960s, things were looking up. The government had drafted a new constitution that granted its citizens the freedom of thought, expression and assembly. Infrastructure development was in full swing, social reforms were opening all sorts of avenues, and Kabul was a flourishing city in the center of the hippie trail. Afghan culture was booming, and western icons were on display in every corner. At the same time, Afghan lawmakers walked freely in public, often without a security detail. There was no fear, apprehension or anxiety. The country was on course to become a democracy. Things couldn't be more exciting for Afghanistan. Yet good intentions are ubiquitous in politics. What is scarce is good policy making. In just the span of a decade, the circumstances changed dramatically, and Afghanistan nosedived into an irredeemable disaster. I'm your host Shirvan, and welcome to Caspian Report. Today's video is sponsored by Morning Brew. Just like most people, I have my own morning rituals. I start with some hot drink and browse the news. Even so, the sheer amount of aimless content on social media can be distracting. Morning Brew helps you pick up the key stories. As a free daily newspaper, it covers everything you need to know about business, finance, tech, geopolitics and so much more. For example, in Afghan related news, the IMF is withholding more than $450 million to Afghanistan, while the United States has frozen about $9 billion in international Afghan reserves. That means the Taliban can access just 0.1% of Afghanistan's reserves. In just a few paragraphs, I got precisely the content that is newsworthy. Morning Brew is free, informative, and takes less than 15 seconds to subscribe. Click the link in the description to sign up for Morning Brew. The year is 1953. King Mohammad Zahir Shah appoints his cousin Sardar Daoud Khan as the Prime Minister of Afghanistan. Daoud Khan is given a distinct mission, modernize the country. Previously, Daoud Khan had served as defense minister, interior minister, ambassador, and military commander in the Afghan army. He was the kind of person who got things done, regardless of the difficulty. But to modernize Afghanistan, Daoud Khan needed financing. The taxes generated by the Afghan population were barely enough to sustain the current operations of the state, let alone finance new, ambitious mega-projects. So the Prime Minister opened his country to the outside world. This was at a time when the Cold War was going strong, and both the Americans and the Soviets wanted influence in the periphery. Daoud Khan figured he could play both sides. Afghanistan, after all, was a big place. In fact, he was once quoted saying, I feel happiest when I can light my American cigarette with Soviet matches. That's the kind of foreign policy he pursued. So various projects were commissioned to both Moscow and Washington. New factories were set up, trade deals were established, while dams, tunnels, bridges and highways were constructed. The most daring of these reforms was an educational program that allowed Afghan students to study at American universities. It was a critical win for Washington. Education is culture, and culture determines ideology. As a countermeasure, the Soviets put together a military package that provided Afghanistan with modern weaponry, including tanks, jets and helicopters, which were all very much needed. You can't have a modern state without a modern army, after all. However, to balance the American educational program, Kabul entered into a military partnership with Moscow, where Afghan officers would receive their training in the Soviet Union. Thus, in the 1970s, while Afghan technocrats were educated according to American curricula, Afghan officers were trained in the Soviet Union. It was a discrepancy that would later come to haunt Afghan politics. Meanwhile, back at home, Daoud Khan was pushing cultural boundaries, specifically the emancipation of women. 
He challenged the religious establishment and carefully construed a social revolution that allowed for a secular way of life. Women began entering the workforce as doctors, teachers and government employees. By 1963, a decade had passed since Daoud Khan assumed office. Under his watch, the responsibilities of the state had ballooned, forcing the government to take on an ever-growing number of technocrats. However, when relations with Pakistan turned sour, King Mohammad Zahir Shah intervened to ease tensions. Daoud Khan relinquished power and what happened next was remarkable. Zahir Shah issued a new constitution that granted his people freedom of expression and assembly while limiting his own authority. This was never seen before. Leaders don't go about restricting their own power voluntarily, but that's exactly what the Afghan king did. He recognized that the machinery of modern governments could not operate efficiently while being limited to the skills of a royal family and its associated nobility. If Afghanistan was to enter the 20th century, it had to nurture the talents of its population and transform into a fully functioning democracy. As such, Zahir Shah prohibited the royal family from entering the political domain. Henceforth, the Afghan royal family was strictly ceremonial. As soon as the new constitution entered into force, political prisoners were freed, independent newspapers sprang up, and a supreme court was established. Most importantly, a new parliament was set up, which was freely elected in 1964. All these swift reforms allowed Afghanistan to transform itself organically. In the ensuing years, foreign goods entered the Afghan market including American jeans, Italian pasta, Dutch bicycles, French perfumes, etc. New hotels, banks, department stores, cafes and housing developments popped up in the major cities. At the epicenter of change was Kabul. Its streets were rife with trucks, tourists, small businesses and Afghan pop music. By 1967, Kabul had all the hallmarks of a modern city. In its downtown, a foreign population had taken root. Americans, Russians and other migrants were living elbow to elbow with local Afghans. Western hippies started trekking across Afghan cities and Kabul became an important destination in the hippie trail that stretched from Europe to India. Life was good and business was booming. By 1970, Afghan high schools were pouring out graduates, girls and boys. In Kabul, women took a liking to Western fashion, while nightclubs popped up that served liquor to foreigners and Afghans alike. The social fabric of Afghan culture was changing, and much of the change was inspired by America and Europe. It seemed like a fairy tale, and it was. The rural population was still living by their traditional customs. Only the urban areas were undergoing this transformation. And even there, not everything was as it seemed. A sinister seed was growing underneath the surface. You see, since the mid-1950s, hundreds of Afghan officers had studied military sciences in the Soviet Union. Their curricula, however, went beyond military subjects and included Marxist-Leninist ideology. As these officers were indoctrinated into communism, they came to view their own country through the lens of Marxism. So when the officers returned home, they passed on their Marxist-Leninist ideas to their fellow countrymen. From there on, communist ideas filtered into the urbanized Afghan society. This process was slow. It took decades to take shape. Just like the hippie movement, it was an organic process. None of it was planned or even predictable at the time. It was trickle-down indoctrination. So, by 1970, Afghanistan had a booming Western-inspired middle class on the surface and a communist-leaning intellectual base underneath. There was a third faction, albeit smaller, one that represented Islamist students from Egypt. Just as Western and communist curricula had inspired a generation of Afghan students, Egyptian-educated students created their own brand of Afghan Islamism. They were loud, 
but few in number. By 1973, social life in Kabul was gushing with conflicting ideas. Workers were on strike, demanding better payment, students were protesting and shutting down schools, Islamists were rambling about the end of days, while military officers were talking about open rebellion. Anarchy, it seemed, was brewing. Then, almost from thin air, Daoud Khan returned to the political fold and executed a flawless coup. He deposed the king and declared himself president. It turned out Daoud Khan had allied himself with one of the many communist groupings. But Daoud Khan was no communist. As soon as he consolidated into power, he turned against his communist allies. Over the next five years, Daoud Khan was purging political rivals from the stage. Then, in April 1978, he launched his most ambitious purge yet, a nationwide effort to detain every communist affiliated leader in Afghanistan. In one fell swoop, he neutralized his rivals, all but one. A communist revolutionary by the name of Hafizullah Amin slipped away. A day later, Daoud Khan got wind of a conspiracy, so he placed tanks across Kabul, waiting in ambush for the culprits. The conspiracy, however, was a ploy. The tank turrets shifted towards the presidential palace, and a firefight broke out. The assault on the presidential palace lasted hours, and apparently some of the rebels spoke Russian. Were the Soviets involved? We don't know, but it wouldn't be out of character. Being the tough guy he was, Daoud Khan went down with a gun in his hand. The communist coup claimed as many as 2,000 casualties, including military, civilian and royal family members. The death of Daoud Khan was a turning point. It set in motion half a century of unyielding conflict. Emerging as the new strongman of Afghanistan, was the charismatic Nur Muhammad Taraki, a household communist leader. Acting as his number two was Amin, who had organized the coup. To fully consolidate power, they started purging the communist party from within. In the streets of Kabul, competing communist factions engaged one another in shootouts. Still more troubling, as Taraki took office, more and more military officers began flexing their muscles, claiming that they were part of the coup and thus entitled to special privileges. No one knew the details precisely, so it was safer to just go with the flow. As such, disobedience consumed the Afghan military. Low-ranking corporals began disrespecting high-ranking superiors. The military hierarchy was paralyzed, unable to distinguish friend from foe. Decades of combat readiness collapsed in a matter of days. In the meantime, Taraki had his plate full. He had to transform Afghanistan into a worker's paradise. So he began issuing all sorts of policies. This came from a man who had no experience in governance and who was carrying out reforms based on Marxist theories. What could possibly go wrong? Now, admittedly, many of Taraki's reforms were well intended especially his emancipation program for women. However, most of the reforms were poorly executed. Take the cancelling of debts to landlords as an example. It sounds noble on paper. Big landlords had long taken advantage of the poor by using predatory loans. Taraki believed he was doing the poor a favor by cancelling debts. But he was completely out of touch with reality. Afghans from the countryside usually borrowed money to either finance weddings or finance funerals. By abruptly cancelling debts, Afghan landlords stopped lending money. Centuries of intricate socio-economic balance was uprooted with the stroke of a pen. Suddenly, Afghans in the countryside could not afford funerals or weddings. Inappropriate policymaking was hurting daily life in rural Afghanistan. A decree on land ownership destroyed traditional forms of water management, leaving the countryside more arid than before. Land reforms resulted in mass crop failures, and the scarcity of resources turned communities against one another. 
Now, by tradition, the Afghan nobility, not the government, had catered to the needs of the rural population. Thus, by going after the rich, the Taraki government took away the rights of the poor without providing a supplementary system. Whereas before, the socio-economic reforms had not affected rural communities, now, with the communist programs, millions of Afghans were left feeling ashamed and dishonored. Protests erupted across the country, and the communist leadership kept producing one disaster after another. By 1979, Afghanistan was in bad shape. A secret police was set up to hunt down dissidents and nurture a cult of personality. President Taraki became Comrade Taraki. Meanwhile, the United States closed its embassy in Kabul, making Afghanistan entirely dependent on the Soviet Union. At the same time, the Soviets had sent some 5,000 technical and military advisors to Afghanistan to help in policymaking. But they didn't always get along with the locals. When protests erupted in the city of Herat, a group of rebels assassinated a few Soviet advisors in the city. What happened next was unimaginable. Either the communist Afghan government or the Soviet Union responded by bombing the city to rubble. Yeah, talk about disproportionate measures. By some accounts, the body count was over 25,000 people. The destruction of Herat was so abrupt, so extreme, that it flipped the country into a state of war. Why the use of such excessive force? We don't know. But the context suggests that it had something to do with the Islamic Revolution in Iran in the same year and the rise of Islamists in Pakistan two years earlier. Perhaps the communists in Kabul and Moscow wanted to send a strong message that civil disobedience would not be tolerated. We just don't know. What we do know is that the bombing of Herat triggered a nationwide armed rebellion. Afghan Islamists many of whom had studied in Egypt, took on the mantle of opposition and initiated an insurgency. Dubbed as the Mujahideen, anti-communism, not Islamism, was the initial unifying narrative. Either way, Mujahideen skirmishes kept on proliferating and soon enough the Afghan countryside was deemed unsafe for the Afghan army, whose combat readiness had already collapsed due to internal strife. Meanwhile, Comrade Taraki had a falling out with his number two, Amin. They started plotting against each other, and after days of back and forth assassination attempts, Taraki supposedly died of natural causes. Amin was now in charge of the country. This was not to the liking of the Soviets, because Amin was considered overly ruthless. And true to his reputation, Amin began a campaign of excessive violence. The secret police stepped up its activities, while airstrikes inside Afghanistan had become a daily occurrence. The Soviets realized that they had to replace Amin before he discredited communism beyond repair. So the Soviet general staff drafted a plan to invade Afghanistan. And in late December 1979, the Red Army was given the go-ahead. Soviet tanks rolled into Afghanistan, while the Soviet Airborne Division secured Bahram Air Base near Kabul. Before the turn of the year, the Soviet military was in control of the Afghan capital. Coincidentally, Amin was dead by the time the Soviet army arrived. But this was not the doing of the Soviets, and more likely the result of internal fighting. Because regardless of how much the Soviets despised Amin, they needed Amin to justify the invasion of Afghanistan. Without Amin, the Soviet military presence was a violation of international law. Thus, to rectify the situation, the Soviet leadership, led by Leonid Brezhnev, handpicked Babrak Karmal and installed him as the new head of state. Karmal was a hallmark name in the Afghan communist world, but he had been living abroad to escape the communist purging so he wasn't exactly up to speed vis-a-vis -vis Afghan power politics. Still, with Karmal in office, Brezhnev could technically argue that the Soviet military was in Afghanistan at the invitation of the Afghan government, and that seemed to be good enough. 
Under Karmal, the state apparatus began falling apart. The Soviets destroyed much of the infrastructure, economic activity came to a halt, trade was disrupted, and the GDP went into freefall. The Mujahideen was increasingly better armed thanks to American, Saudi, and Pakistani backing. Plus, a continuous batch of foreign fighters flocked to join the ranks of the Mujahideen, giving the conflict a religious essence, a holy war, if you will. But the main strength of the Mujahideen was their lack of unity. Without a central command, it was impossible to bargain with the rebels. Instead of just one conventional army, the Soviets fought dozens of militias with distinct tactics and strategies. The new Soviet leadership, led by Mikhail Gorbachev, realized the situation was irredeemable. So, he devised a ferocious policy to depopulate the Afghan countryside. It was an incomprehensibly ruthless strategy. More than a million people died in the first year, and millions more fled abroad. The exodus changed the Afghan identity to its core. Centuries of carefully crafted socio-economic institutions shattered beyond redemption. Afghanistan, not just the country and its material belongings, but the fabric of Afghan culture broke from within. Afghan policymakers had tried their hand at a game of geopolitical chess. They tried playing the superpowers simultaneously. What they got was a failed state. Both the powerful and weak paid the price a thousandfold. Because when a game of chess ends, the king and pawn go into the same box. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. Please consider joining our Patreon platform. Doing so helps us to remain self-sufficient. Thank you for watching and Saul.